Good day, sir. Hello. <laughs> Your name? Purcell Vandenberg. And when were you born, Mr. Vandenberg? I was born in 1932. 1932? Yes. In, in Mooresville? In Mooresville? Yes. Okay. About a mile down the road here. So you grew up in this church? Yes. What, uh, what are some of the things that you remember about Mooresville growing up? Well, I remember, you know, the church was over here by that tree. That was the back of the church, that old church. And uh, it was a school over here. And uh, it was known as one of the bigger black schools around. They closed up some. It was further out and moved the children into this school. So we had uh, three rooms. <laughs> and uh, we had three teachers to start. I mean, you know, when I started. And uh, we had a Reverend Henry. He was our principal. Then we had a Miss Smith. She used to teach the third, fourth grade. We had a Miss Feemster. She taught the first and the second grade. Reverend Henry, he had the fifth and the sixth. So uh, my older brothers and sisters, <clears throat> they went to school here. And this was the only school that we knew. Brawley School was here, but it, we weren't allowed to go there. My mother told me that when they first started here, they gathered around a, a big oak tree, and had service. Then after that, uh, the man, Mara, gave them four acres of land. After that, they built the arbor and uh, they start having service under the arbor till they built the one room church and they stayed in that church to you know it's, they couldn't use it anymore and at the time that had the church you know they had the school moral school so they uh start having church in the schoolhouse. They'd have school through the week, and then on Sunday they'd have church. They had church in the schoolhouse to, they built, built this. I think this was built in 1955. By the time I, you know, finished school here, uh, the birdhouse had closed too, you know, they had built Dunbar. So uh, that was the first high school that we knew, you know. And uh, some of us was able to go to Dunbar. So after, the, when they closed the school, they sent the children to Dunbar, that was in the 1950-something. And uh, then something happened, and they moved them to Shepherd. And then they went on from there, you know, to Stateful. And uh, that, was, that was where the children had their high school. Oh, and it'd be kind of bit and rain, and, and we had to go to school, you know, you know. It's rough try to go to school and walk two or three miles. I know I remember going going to school in Nailtown. When you were uh when you, you were walking but I, I heard some say that while you were walking that the whites was being bussed. Oh yes. They had a bus and then sometimes they caused 
uh, out of our name. Oh, there you go. Look at them. Yeah, I heard that too. They would do that. You know, a bunch of them get together, they call a little new new. Look at them down there. And they had buses, but we had the bus that they had two or three years ago. When I entered school, I was going to school on School Street. There was um, a frame building there, two story. And I think I went there for two years. Then uh, Dunbar was built. And from then on, I went to Dunbar, and I'm a graduate of Dunbar. Um, I graduated in 1951. My first year of school was the first year of Dunbar's opening. The principal was uh, Mr. Woods. Uh, Margaret, Margaret Caldwell was the first grade teacher. Dotson Miller was a second and third grade teacher. Claire Neely was a fourth grade teacher. There were some others, Mr. Banner and Penix and Woods, uh, Professor Woods taught a couple classes too. Dunbar was um, the biggest school that I had been ever been in because we had been used to the two bed, the two room schools where you had the um, pot, but pot belly stove and the stoked the fires and everything but anyway um i was fifth grade when i moved here so it was um it was pretty exciting for me you know to change classes and all that kind of thing um we used to have a um mrs miller who lived in mosul but taught at unity high in state so whenever they would have talent shows she'd take a a uh, carload of us up there, and we would go to Unity and be on the talent shows and, and that kind of thing. We had sock hops and all of that, but you know that's about that's about what we did uh, growing up. Can you tell us about sock hops? Mm. <laughs> yeah, you know they were just the little uh, boy girl thing. Uh, the teachers were always there, and uh, we had. Uh, we would go and dance till about 10 o'clock at night, and then we would all, they'd close it down and we'd all go home. But that was our recreation. Well, I went to school and gra I graduated from uh, Dunbar High School here in Mooresville. Actually, uh, I lived uh, parallel to the school. Yeah, sometimes I would wait until 8 o'clock of five minutes till, and I'll be there right on time. So, yes, uh, yeah, I was right next door to the school, yeah. It was a good time? Oh, wonderful time. Uh, we were a small school, and it was 40, I think it was 43 students in, in the first grade when we started. And when we graduated, I think it was 12. Yes. What, um, what are some of the things you remember doing in school? Uh, well, I always wanted to play football, but we didn't have enough students in the whole school for a football <laughs> team. So uh, we played basketball. And we had a very good team. We won a lot of trophies. Uh, baseball. Uh, actually, a baseball field was uh, adjacent to uh, where we lived. And I would be out there, and my friends, uh, we were like uh, 14, 15, 16. We'll, be, we'll play ball all day long in the summertime because we didn't have anything else that we, uh, to do, and we really enjoyed it. So you got pretty good at it. Oh, yes. Uh, I went to New Jersey. I played with the uh, New Jersey Jets, and we played in uh, uh, Wigway Park. And, 
in the uh, 60s, 65, 66, uh, we were invited to uh, Greenville, South Carolina, where we had, uh, we played a uh, team there. Yeah, and that's the furthest so we traveled from New Jersey to uh, South Carolina. Segregated teams, or? Yes. Okay. Yes. Hey, how you doing? I'm Jeffrey Houston. I've been in this church all my life, and I'm 61 years old. I was born in 1961 here in Mooresville, North Carolina. I did not grow up down here in Mayhew Town. I grew up downtown. They had started leaving the country, and they started going toward town. And that's when my mother and father and my grandmother, we all lived uptown. And we all lived in the same neighborhood on the hike, what we call the Eastern Hike, black area in Mooresville. There were two areas at the time, Eastern Hike and Cascade. West End wasn't there yet because they hadn't built the projects yet. But we started out with two black neighborhoods, Eastern Hike and Cascade. And I was part of the hike gang. And yes, and we did thought we were better than Cascade. That's kind of crazy, but we did. No, we was all poor, but we thought we were better than the other, you know? That trash up on Cascade, thank God we ain't them. You know, and you sitting there saying, why are we putting each other down? Should we put, even then we would thought to hold each other down, you know? But I grew up in a time when we was, lived in a neighborhood that was completely black. Like 20, 30 houses, shacks, 10 roofs, dirt, dirt yards, you know? You go out every morning, you sweep your yard. That's how I grew up. You know, we had a milkman to come every day and put your milk on the porch. You get it. We played in the wood. We didn't have, I'm going to take that back. We had a TV in our house, but we was not allowed to use it. Back in the day, children were supposed to stay outside and play. I don't care what the weather was. Well, if, if it was thunder and lightning, you came in. But it was hot, you stayed outside. It didn't matter. Stay under the tree. Get under the shade tree. You'd be all right. So we were forced to stay outside and we really got to know the country. We got to know the woods. We got to know the trees. We was wild children, you know, just having fun. And that's how I grew up. I came to more because I wanted to, I wanted to be a, back then I wanted to be an undertaker. And I came to work for Kevin. And when I came to work for them, I thought, you know, everything was going to be hokey-dory. But I found out it was different. I put up tents, washed cars, and I stayed in the basement until I got ready to go off to school. And I left them, and believe it or not, I didn't think a white man would cry to see a black man go. But I went to Cincinnati and one of the fellas that worked with me, was a white fella, he carried me to Cincinnati to embalming school. And even up the even at when I went to Cincinnati, do you know there was places I couldn't even go? Couldn't go because I had a black face. Now, I had, I, I had graduated, got all, all these certificates and all this stuff on the wall. And believe it or not, they still treat, or they treat you know, still treat you like dirt. But I never will forget what the head man told me. He, he was laying on the, on, the, on the couch when I was, went to be interviewed. He says, my work is hard and less pay. That didn't bother me. I wanted to learn the business. I wanted to know how to do the embalming, uh, what to do and how to do. But the bad part that really got me when we got paid, the man brought our checks downstairs, me and another fellow, Mr. Vandenberg, was working there. And he told me, now listen to this, 
he says, I can't pay you what I pay my white boys. He says, because you be making more than they making. Now, that's what he told me, but I stuck with that. And that's when I went home and I told my mama and daddy about it. They told me, say, that's what you wanted to do. So if you make your bed hard, you got to sleep in it. Oh, uh, they all they all knew they knew Vance. Uh, my father was the bootlegger, and he was considered the biggest bootlegger in Iredale County. Okay, and because he was that, when they when holiday season came, the sheriff and everybody more would call Vance and say, Vance, do you think we can get a a, a, a gallon of liquor? And he said. I don't know why you calling me out a gallon of liquor. I don't sell liquor. And they would both have a laugh about that. And he said, you know where to put it for me, Vance, and I'll put your money there. And that was that. So, so that he had he had he had a relationship with every, with everybody. Yeah. And they knew him and, and they knew him to be an honest man, hard working man, and, and 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 also a religious man, church goer, all of that. Superintendent of the, of the Sunday school at St. Paul Methodist Church, there every Sunday morning teaching teaching the Bible to people. He that that was that was my father. Yeah. And anybody needed anything. If you went to the bank and you needed a loan, they may say no, but then they'd ask you if you were black. You know Vance Neal. And he said yes. He said, "Why don't you call Vance and uh, tell him what you want and see if he'll come out here and sign for you?" And he would, but he would make sure. Okay, now you got to pay this. You have to pay this. And they did. They paid it because Vance put his his name out there for them. Black history is more like I recall uh, some people uh, it, being that it was the black community that you would know who was well known for certain things. Uh, like my great grandfather George Ramsey was one of the first uh, trash men back in the day uh, for the city. Uh, he used to haul trash with a mule and a wagon. I mean, you would know people's first of being certain things in our in our history because uh, they would become well known for it. Uh, so Black History Moors, if you knew somebody famous or knew somebody had done something, it was historical at the moment they did it. So. Uh, it was pretty well known who done what or who made changes, who did these things, and their name would flow through the community on who they were. So black history pretty much uh, in our community is well remembered. You remember who done what and who was famous for doing what and who was well known for doing what or who opened doors for others to do certain things. So it was pretty much known if you knew who people were. So, Do you remember any stories of your grandfather telling you? Well, he used to, uh, he had a mule named Jack. And uh, my, my, my grandfather used to tell me, he used to, uh, before everybody went to bed, they had to give a Bible scripture back in that day. The Bible, I guess, was the book of choice of the house in that day. And he would have them quote scriptures, and and, and he himself would, would, would minister himself. Uh, he was a minister in his own right. Uh, but those things I remember from word of mouth coming down through time and and they will follow through through family history. You know, I know over some of the time, it, so many things have changed, but it would flow down through history. When I graduated high school, I just did domestic work for about a year. Then my mother said, you need to do, get some more education. So I, I traveled to Charlotte to Carver College and got some training there. And then later on, when we were, of course, past the segregation, I was able to get continuing ed at Central Piedmont Community College. The black college for that college was Carver College. Can you? Uh huh. Can you and, tell us more uh, about that? I, I don't think I've ever heard of Carver College. It was a little college created for black children who had graduated high school. It was an offshoot of Central Piedmont Community College. And, uh, we would um, carpool about four of us from Mooresville there. However, we knew our place, you know, we knew we could not go certain places or do certain things. In fact, when I went to the library to check out books, um, I was told that I, they didn't want to serve me. And this is when I had become an adult. But uh, later on, I was able to go there and um, 
check out books and and do things there in Louisville. My name is Brenda McKee. Brenda McKee. And tell us, um, you're a resident of Mooresville, lifelong resident? A lifelong resident of Mooresville. Okay. What are some of the things you remember about Mooresville growing up here that has stuck out in your memory? The thing that I remember was we had to walk by two schools to get to one school. We walked from Sharp Street up to the top of the hill at South School was on the right. We crossed over, went across the tracks and down to the First Preps 10 Church. And to the right, you could go to Mosley Junior High School. And we kept on walking until we got to Dunbar. Can you tell why did you have to keep walking? Because it was segregation. Segregation. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. During that time of segregation, were there any places that you were forbidden to go? Or were you able to, were you accepted in all the places here in town? No. And then, yeah, we were forbidden to go, forbidden to go a lot of places because our parents didn't, you know, allow us to go places. We knew where to go and where not to go. I remember the dime store. We always went in the side door at the bottom of my man, the five and dime. And there's probably a lot of stores, but I don't remember them all, but we didn't go to certain places. We knew better. How was the race relationship uh, with folks of Morrisville? Mm. I don't, I don't know. We stayed in our place and they stayed in their place. Like walking to school, we were on one side of the, the uh, sidewalks and they would be on the other side. Or either they would be waiting, trying to make us get off into the street so they could come down and walk the sidewalks. When they tried to make you get off the streets and things, did that cause uproar? Were there conflicts and fights and riots or anything? Among the kids, we had no, we didn't do any riot, and I don't know anything about riot, you know, anything like that. Fear tactics is what they uh, are used against you, as long as they can keep you fearful, they can keep you in control. And our parents had experienced, they had seen firsthand some of the things that could happen to you if you go out and not stay in what they said, your place. If you did go out and, and you rebel against uh, what you felt like was uh, unfair, uh, ill treatment, if you resisted them, then you were in a, a greater danger because they would find ways of getting rid of you. If you didn't meet some accident, you would meet the judge and wind up with lengthy terms in prison for mediocre offenses. I had, had experienced uh, firsthand my brother uh, was at one of the functions on Main Street one night. Uh, and him and one of his classmates got into a little skirmish. And this police officer came up and got between them and he they had the place roped off. He took a rope, a loose from the pole, and struck my brother in the face with it. And he told the white boy, go home, I have your daddy to deal with you. You going to jail. And that's when I interviewed him. I said, no, he's not. He said, well, who are you? I said, that's my brother. I said, and you're not going to send that boy home and send my brother to jail when they both were guilty of the same thing. And it, it broke out into a big thing that night. But of course, the next morning, they had about, one well, about four police cars in Mooresville, but they were all in front of my house the next morning to carry me uptown to tell me what all could happen to me. And I said, well, I mean, it's your choice, you do it. Whatever it is you want to do, do it. But after talking to some other people that uh, knew me and knew uh, some of my people, they came to an agreement to let me go with a warrant. Don't do that again. If you feel like you've been done wrong, go to a higher authority. What was the higher authority? same ones that 
incriminating me to begin with. It's different when a law is passed. You cannot in any way make somebody want to be where you are. Uh, I remember thinking about how it would be to go in the front door of a restaurant. We'd always gone in the back. You know, we didn't, you not, you didn't dare <laughs> go to the front door. And I, I, oh, it was so, I mean, you really don't realize what it does to you in the inside when you're taken from what you feel is comfortable. I mean, I, I always had black people there to encourage me, to tell me I could do this, tell me I could do that. What do you want to be when you grow up? You know, you can do that, but to come out into the world where integration began, it was still, you got to earn it. And they weren't always nice. The jobs I had, even as nanny, uh, <laughs> I had to work through it. Because there is a 12 year age difference between us. When I came along, I was pushed to go towards education, which is why I'm still now an information junkie. I realized that that just wasn't fair because mm -hmm. our grandmother and our dad, our dad worked at the, worked at Moore's Mill. Yes. And he was known as a jokester, but little did they know he was joking, but he really wasn't joking. Mm -hmm. Because he always was this way. He'd always make you laugh to throw you off balance. Yeah. And so that's how our dad got through. Junior high was fairly new. Because when I went to junior high, I was an old junior high. I used to be the old Central High School. And that was the first year that North Carolina, you know, bit the bullet. I mean, the blacks and whites could go to, you had an option. That's The first year was an option year. The second year was mandatory. And I went to the old junior high, I was out there playing marbles. We are still playing marbles and as a part of the recreation doing the day, recess or whatever. And a white kid, a white kid came up and like threw dirt in my face. Um, other things is I felt like you could tell that and it's the t same old story, you know. I think white people were trying to adjust to, uh, when we went to the new junior high, brand new school, like a brand new penny, some of the teachers would just kind of ignore you, wouldn't ask you questions. You just felt like that you were like marginalized. And one of the experiences I had, <laughs> they had the basketball court on the left-hand side of facing like, I think it was a science room. And so we would go out there for recess. And <laughs> this is kind of funny in a way. Um, so, so a couple of kids were still out there playing. And as I walked into the classroom, I heard the teacher say, that nigger is uh, taking his ball. And other than that, I. I think they thought we were going to be low performers, so they wouldn't like ask or challenge. And that's the bad thing. You got to make challenge these kids, make them read, and you got to start that at home. I went to Dunbar High School at first, it was 12, up until the sixth grade. And it seemed like it was more corporal type of punishment. You know, you had Norris F. Woods, he was like, I believe he was a white man. They said he was black, but he looked like a white man. And it seems like I, my memories of Dunbar is that you're always getting your hand slapped or something like that. Or I don't remember much education going the first two to sixth grade, other than when we played the, the Christmas thing that had the little flutes or whatever. We all learned a song that I can still play. I don't remember much on that, and there was a lot of fights. Uh, and then the books. 
And you've probably heard this story. You get the books. They were old books that used to belong to white people. We didn't get brand new books. And so they probably were out of date and you would see other people's name signed in those books. And so all these things probably just kind of put in that you're not good enough. I got a lot of that, but, uh, you know, I you can't continue to live. I mean, racism not going to work. You need to find some way to circumvent it, get around it. What year uh, did you graduate high school here in Morrisville? 1974. And what school was that? Morrisville Senior High School. Morrisville Senior High, okay. Is there any memories of Morrisville Senior High you'd like to share with us today? Uh, yeah, several. I mean, I was quite active. I uh, played all sports. I ran track, played basketball, played football. I was active on campus. Uh, I was uh, in the student council, actually, the president of the student council. The historical fact is I was the first black president of the student council on board of senior high. And uh, I was in chorus, like, I thought, you know, like music. Post-civil rights movement, we were starting to kind of coexist a little bit better as a race of people, you know, as far as the racism thing was going on. I mean, North Carolina probably had, uh, you know, one of the widest uh, planned uh, things going on during that period of time, uh, so primarily in the eastern part of North Carolina. I didn't experience it much. I remember the guy down that used to run city news, you know, we very friendly, but he always would flash his clan car. <laughs> We all got along pretty good. I don't remember having a whole lot of issues, you know, you know, especially the football team. You know, we, there was camaraderie there where we would all get together and do things, you know, go to the lake, hang out, do things that high school kids do, <laughs> the, the, uh, the typical things, and uh, Mooresville. When I started to travel and meet other people, you know, coming out of Mississippi, Georgia and stuff like that, I didn't, I wasn't aware of the kind of the extreme racism that, because who, my opinion, we knew there was, it was there, but it was never, because, I mean, we all came together, I mean, and that's kind of how I got started on that book you were asking me about. You know, we all would meet up on Main Street, you know, the, the the white people off of the meal hill and uh, and we'd all just run them down the streets through the creeks over uh, around and then the park over there where they had the airplane and, and I think they had a baseball field over there we would just hang out there and, you know occasionally somebody might maybe call you <laughs> but it'd always be that one remote little guy. But one of the experiences that I like to tell is Mama worked as a domestic over on Mill Hill. And we went over there one day. And I, I guess that was the first time it really hit me. And Daddy drove us over there to pick Mama up. And so when she came out, as we were driving off, the kids were saying, Bye, niggers. Bye, niggers. <laughs> I mean, it's not. The, it's sort of kind of funny in a way. I started at Mooresville Junior High School. I think it was in 1968 when uh, segregation started, and so we had um, first period, second period, third period, all of this stuff that we had to get used to. Um, that was a, a little different for us, and we were a little slow in picking things up. But once we did. You know, it's like okay, this is a this is this is all right. We're 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 getting to know everyone in town, you know, and so let's all work together. Um, and that's for a start. So, in other words, uh, you, were you and Ray Duff in the same class, or were yeah? Um, what happened was uh, when we uh, when the school segregated. 
uh, Ray and I were in the same class in the seventh grade and getting there and everything was so, so different that I, I don't know if I became scared or whatever, but my, the teachers knew that I could do better. So they called my father and said, we want to hold um, Austin back a year because we know that he will excel. So my father was out gardening and uh, after the first year and told me that um, the teacher says they, they would pass you on, but I told them no, because I know that you are a smart kid. So I want you to repeat your grade. Best thing I ever did, because after that I did, I hated it for a while. So did my brother, because I was in his class. You know, Austin, I think that all of us, when we, when the schools was integrated, I think we all kind of had it tough there from the first year when the school was integrated because uh, you think about it, we all came from predominantly our own race uh, yeah. of, of class of, 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 of people we were around and, uh, and moved us into an environment that uh, was kind of tough, a lot of us and a lot of a lot of a lot of them uh the first year just quit they they quit school yeah. because of uh, that but then some of them went back later on and got the ged some of them went back and <clears throat> finished school some of them went back and then went to college and did great things for themselves but that first year was just <clears throat> i think it was a little bit tough for a lot of us because if you think about it when they integrated the schools a lot of people don't realize that the integration where it came in was a lot of the black female teachers that was the one that that initiated the uh that the schools be uh, uh desegregated because of the the educational uh purposes and uh, you know for yourself a lot of books that we got at Dunbar was handed down books you didn't have pages in it and and a lot of things of this nature and then when they integrated the, the the schools if you notice most of the black schools uh, they closed down and the ones that didn't close down the teachers was without a job then the teachers to me were the smartest uh, yeah. what was some of your experiences there uh you know when you first went there i mean do you feel that uh, uh some of the kids was did you ever experience racism uh, your first year or so? Maybe? Um, not me personally. Um, I'm usually wide eyed uh, about any new situation and try to um, just blend in. Um, I did see through other black friends the difficulties that, that they were having um, and I think basically there was a wall up, you know, not allowing themselves to get to know these people. Um, you know, uh, their books <laughs> were, you know, different than what we had. So that was one of the main struggles. That was my struggle at first until I got my, my um, arms around it. And then I was able to um, say, okay, I can do this. Um, there were some you would hear uh, in playground, people getting a little scuffed. You would hear the N word, uh, would, would start fights and riots. There, at junior high school, um, you're at that adolescent age, anywhere where you're uh, you're just you know full of so much energy that anything can happen. So that happened a lot at um, uh, then. But um, for me, um, I was always pretty calm and and just going with the flow and just trying to get to know people so i made a lot of friends uh my second time around uh, when i repeated my grade in the seventh grade and then i started ex excelling and becoming more popular and getting to know people got into the band and um started running for offices and uh, they would have an office set aside basically for the black students we were outnumbered so therefore, you know, in order for us to be a class officer, we had to be, it had to be set aside for first vice president as blacks only. 
Um, so I ran for that, I won. Uh, so I got to know more people, got on different committees um, and became a drum major uh, for the junior high school band. Got known uh, pretty well for that. So then I would tell a lot of my like friends, listen, you just, you're holding yourselves back. You know, you need to show these people that you are smart, that you can do this. You, you've got to let go of the anger. Yes, it's different, but we'll get used to it. Yeah. I have one question when you said drum major. I yeah. bet, I just bet you was the first black drum, drum major there, were you? I was the, the first black uh, drum major in a junior high school, yes. But the first black drum major all in all was Sylvester Pinkston. And okay. that's who, that's who I, um, I admired, and that's why I wanted to be drum major in junior high school, because I used to watch Sylvester dance uh, in the parade and, and, and football players, and I wanted to be just like him. So once I did get to um, high school, Sylvester had uh, graduated. Um, I was the second uh, black drum major there, and I also danced and danced in the parade and um, also went to competition and um, won an award for a drum major or something like that. So, um, so that, that set off my, uh, my, my acting career, entertainment career. Uh, of course, I went to school at Unity High School, graduated in 1963. Uh, went to college at a and anybody who, who's an Aggie, Aggie pride. And uh, I went in as an English teacher, and of course, I also uh, taught history. Later on, I became a counselor, assistant principal, principal, and central office person. I met the love of my life uh, in 1968, and I believe this is the same year that I met uh, Ella. Uh, at the time, she was Ella April, and she and my wife were like two peas in a pod. I will agree there. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I was one that uh, went to Moors of the first year in 66 when they uh, integrated. It was not pretty uh, when uh, we went there when we first, the first year we got there. Uh, with Miss Nanny and uh, and some of us kind of told Miss Nanny about it later on in in life, uh, but when we seen him, he was you know, some age, but. So works. maybe, maybe your first year, maybe you made it better for us when we got there a second year. Maybe we didn't, maybe we didn't see, you know, because you had paved, you know, gotten okay. some of the kinks out. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's what had happened because uh, it wasn't pretty the first year. It was a lot of, uh, name calling a lot of uh teachers was picking on a lot of the minority kids uh they was like a walk in the door just when the bell was ringing they was uh it was it was pretty rough when we were the first year but uh we fought back and uh i think uh now things have changed you asked if we were the only two biology teachers i think we were and then there was chemistry and physics under mr phillips who was also the assistant principal that year, 67, 68, 68, 69. That's pretty powerful um, in the late 60s to, to, to be able to say that if you had biology, you had a Black woman, regardless of, yeah, <laughs> of yeah. how you looked at it. And that, I mean, yeah, so I'm, I'm glad. I'm really glad to hear that about Morris Sloan. Mr. Sloan, are you ready? Uh, mute. All yes, right. Uh, okay. My name is Craig Sloan. Uh, I'm originally from Mooresville. Um, I was born in October of 1959. I grew up on West End side of town. Uh, my mother's name was Rebecca Sloan. Uh, my father's name was Norris Graham, uh, who was the brother of Terry Graham, who owned Terry's Taxi. Uh, and <clears throat> Rebecca Sloan was the daughter of James Campbell, who owned 
Campbell's Cleaners. Uh, so we grew up um, around a lot of business folks, black business folks. And uh, I was, we grew up in uh, Jones Chapel Baptist Church, which is now Campbell's Missionary Baptist Church, uh, next to Woods School, which was Dunbar School at that time. Uh, I did the first and second grade at Dunbar School. And in the third grade, we would move to South School, which was located where there's a big Methodist church across from the cemetery on Center Street. Uh, that was where South School was located. And uh, as we grew up through school, uh, we made a lot of friends. And, and uh, if you were to look at my Facebook page or something now, it's very uh, diverse. They can put you at the back of the class and you not even know it. You can make a, you, you, you could go in there and make the best grade, but the white kid next door would get the award for it and not you. But you never thought they were mistreating you. We go try for football and there's 20 blacks trying out for football. Here's the God's the truth. And only two blacks made it, myself and another black guy because his mother was a teacher. They put him on the team. He couldn't play no football, had no talent at all, but they put him on the football team and they cut all the other black guys. And I got on it because I was still one of the first blacks that came to school there and they were still using me as a, an example because I was raised to keep your mouth shut, say yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, I don't care what race you were. You could be white, black, or gray. My parents taught me to say, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. That's embedded in me, even today. I'm 61 years old, and I still say, yes, ma'am, to anybody. And expect the same say back to me, you know? So that's how I was raised. So I'm going to show respect no matter what you show me. Because my parents didn't really teach us about how they were going to mistreat us when we wasn't around them. They never taught us that. They never told us that because they went through the back door. They say, yes, sir, no, sir. That's how it was embedded in them. So they didn't care. They thought it was okay for us to be treated the same way. But I thank God that my mother wanted Bella. Came home one day and she told my daddy, we're going to move. Lived in a black neighborhood at that time. And my daddy said, we're going to move. Yeah, we're going to move. We moved into a white neighborhood in 1970. We moved into a white neighborhood. First black family that moved to a white neighborhood. And we moved in that neighborhood that day, and Daddy had moved all the stuff in. Him and his friends had moved all the bunch of men, had moved all the furniture in, and they had left. The man next door had got a gun. Was it a gun? Yeah, he had got a stick, not a gun. I'm going to tell you where the gun came in at. He had got a stick, and he was beating on our windows, walking around our house, beating on the window. You, you in, got to get out of here. And my mama heard it, and my mama ran into the bedroom because the first thing daddy brought in that house was his guns. And mama ran in there. Lord, we're in the church, but I'm going to tell you another way. Mama ran in there and got the gun and put it right in his face. And she said, today ain't the day for that. None of y'all going to ever come back to my house beating on windows or beating on doors. You're going to show me some respect while I live here. The man backed up. The man didn't even live there. The neighbors got him and told him, you got to leave. And from then on, they apologized for my mom for the next 30 years we lived there. For the past few years, if a black family moves out, mostly they put a white family in where they moved out. And there used to be a time you couldn't pay a, a white person to live down here. Because when these apartments were put down here, they were put for black people. And that's who was here. But you find as many whites now as you do blacks down here, so. Worked in, in uh, homes mostly. And then when the, they got to opening the meals for black people, went into the meal and worked. 
do you have any stories about domestic work? I assume this is your company. Yeah, when I say worked in homes, yeah, domestic work. Mm -hmm. Do you have any stories about that? Nah, I was just glad to get out of there. <laughs> well, yeah, I worked for this old preacher uh, for so many years. I don't know how many years, but... White preacher. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, when I started working for them, his wife was living. And then she passed away during the time, and I worked for him several more years. Um, then he left, he, he retired. He was at, at the ARP church. He was a minister there, and he retired. And moved to Charlotte, and I went down there and worked for a while uh, for him. <laughs> and it was, it was, you know, he used to say all the time, I, I, I got you in my wheel. And you would never guess how much he left me in his wheel. But anyway, he didn't have to do that either, but, you know. Well, you know, I'm here, I'm here You want to know, don't you? <laughs> but, I, but he came through on it. Fifty bucks. <laughs> the old Mooresville was a a. Let's start with the black community. The old Mooresville, where we had traditional black neighborhoods, a Bell Street, a Cascade. West End, Eastern Heights, um, was one where we helped each other. We uh, looked out for each other. Uh, even at this church, um, uh, church started at 11 o'clock, but people was out here for Sunday school. And after Sunday school, back then, a lot of uh, uh, the men of the church had gardens, and they would exchange uh, vegetables and the ladies would exchange recipes and pies and everything. It was it was it was a feeling of togetherness, unity, unity, um, and that was not just the Reeves Memorial. That was uh, other the other historically black churches in the area. Um, with the new Mooresville, that is gone, uh, unfortunately. Now, here's the thing: we can sit and point fingers. This person, the white man. Uh, um, we can even say the the money that the, the the people that moves here from from up north, but a lot of it is our self. We have to take self inventory of ourselves. We have to take inventory of our communities. We have to stand on our principles. We have to stand. I, I I was fortunate enough to do a message talking about getting back to the basics. We have to get back to the basics within our churches. Especially our churches, where the churches were the central center foundation of our neighborhoods. All of that is gone. All of that is gone. Gone for good. It's up to us. It's, it is up to us. We have to get out and and vote. That's another thing that that's lacking. You know, we can complain all we want to, but until we actually get up, get out, and do something, then nothing is going to change. Um, that's the difference in. New Mooresville. New Mooresville presents a lot more opportunities. But the opportunities are not just going to come to us. We have to go get them. There's a lot more opportunities. As a Mooresville citizen, do you feel that you've always understood or it's been articulated to you your importance, uh, the importance of your, of your vote specifically as a black man? No, one of the one of the unfortunate things that that within the black community um, is your vote don't matter. You know, it's not going to make a difference. Uh, They're going to do what they're going to do. But we do thank God for men like Reverend Johnson that down through the years have hammered this thing home year after year after year who have paved the way for myself. I mean, uh, 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 I don't like to name names because I, I tend to leave, leave people out. Uh, uh, Thurman Houston, um, who serves as mayor pro tem, 
Um, he actually opened the door and, and educated me on some of the, uh, I, not necessarily politics, but some of the uh, local government opportunities in which just the average citizen can go in and serve. No different anymore. I mean, you, you got an opportunity to live anywhere. You're not segregated in these four corners anymore in Mooresville. I can honestly, several years ago, it's probably the first time I lived on the street that had a sidewalk in front of my house. The infrastructure, the small thing, people think it's a big thing that make life different. And, I, and for us, as me as a black man, it was that sidewalk in front of my house have been the most impressive thing that I've seen because I finally got a house with a sidewalk on it. And a lot of people, I've heard people come in front of our board, well, I don't care if you don't put me a sidewalk, but just put me some curb and gutters, little things. And, and now we get it. We, we, we got an infrastructure and tied in that it was because of acts. That's because, honestly, I have to say, I wonder because I get tired of riding through my town and I can see the street stop. That That's just not a metropolitan city <laughs> when you're walking in a ditch to get to the next street that's not even long as this table. You stop it. And so to me, it was infrastructure, education, and job opportunities. To the people courage is a weapon and it's lethal it was a lot of times that we lost lives but never a hard time we couldn't see through all we gotta do is keep our heads high lead with love that's something we can spread right i'm from troutman but nevertheless i respect the mo 28115 and we can never ever second guess us we stay strong whenever they would suppress us keep your feet down keep your heart high God, I always hear you when your heart cry. I said we can never ever second guess us. Stay strong whenever they would suppress us. Keep your feet down, keep your heart high. And God, I always hear you when your heart cry.